almost done with the book. We are on chapter 18, titled, Why Have Experiments at All? Um, and that's a legitimate question. Um, I've said a lot of negative things about UBI experiments throughout this book, throughout the class. Um, and um, some people have come away from lectures that I've given on, on, on this issue and say, oh, that's it. Yeah, I'm, we should not be having experiments. We shouldn't do them, it's a bad idea. Um, and uh, being really much more negative about experiments than I am. Um, and, but yet that's not what I am trying to say in this book. Um, I think I told you that, that uh, when I, uh, I, 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 um, I tried answering that question even tentatively, um, but when, if I try to answer that question, the whole book then becomes about why we should or should not be having them. And that's not what it's about. The book is about how do we make the best of the experiments that we are in fact having. That's what the book is about. Adding the question of whether we should have them or not is, uh, is just a, an added confusion. Uh, also, another reason I don't wanna, I, I don't wanna say, I definitely don't wanna say do not have experiments because um, it's different in different political contexts. In some contexts, it is, it, it, is a really, it is a really good idea, a good thing. In other contexts, it won't be such a good idea. It depends what your alternatives are. And so I'm not, and I'm definitely, even if I think your experiment is a mistake, um, I, I'm not the one that's in going into your office every day, conducting the stuff, raising the money, putting that stuff out there. I'm not gonna tell you, I'm not gonna curse the person who lights a candle in the darkness. That, that phrase is wrong. You know, it's better to light one candle than it is to curse the darkness. The phrase should be something like, it's better to light one candle than to complain that the guy who lit one candle didn't do enough to get rid of the darkness. Well, they're doing their best. You know, what are you doing? Um, so these people who are running the spirits are all doing their best either to further science or to further the cause of UBI or in some cases, both. Um, I don't want to criticize them, but I, what I do want to do is to make sure that experiments are going to be understood and are going to be less vulnerable to spin, misunderstanding, misuse, and so on. And so we've got to think about this. Well, in that context, why should we have experiments? So uh, I, I talk about this in the book. I talk about it from two perspectives, the scientific reasons and uh, and strategic reasons. Um, and I really think the strategic reasons are the big question. The big questions are strategic reasons. It is very clear that these experiments are an outgrowth of the UBI movement. As I've said, they're both an input into the growth of the movement, but they're also an outcome of how much the movement has grown. They're, they're intertwined with the political economy of UBI. There is no constituency out there that's just curious. Um, the, the, there's nobody that's, that, that's just curious. Uh, this is something I wanna know more about. I really don't feel anything about it one way or another. Let's just research it because we all love spending millions of dollars to ask questions that we're curious about. It's never purely scientific on this kind of issue. Other kinds of issues it is. Um, if you're researching the black hole at the center of the galaxy, that's really not tied up with politics. That is pure scientific curiosity. Uh, UBI experience aren't going to be like that. Now, so, but, but from the scientific question, approach, one of the questions you need to ask is, can it settle the question? And the answer is clearly no. It cannot settle the question, but that is unrealistic in social science. It's to the extent that it could settle anything. That question was answered back in 1972, which is, is UBI gonna cause a massive withdrawal from the labor force um, uh, and, and, and make it so it's just completely unaffordable, can't be done. 
That issue, I think, has been settled and settled and settled again by every experiment we've had. There's never been massive withdrawal from the labor force, force even when we've had fairly generous UBIs as much as 150% of the poverty line. If you go above that, at some point, you would get massive withdrawals and it would be unaffordable. Um, but but, uh, but uh, we really, it's no compelling reason to find out what that top level is at this point. It's unrealistic to asset from a social science experiment, which makes it confusing because that question is not unrealistic for other kinds of experience. A lot of experiments in astrophysics have settled questions in astrophysics. Um, the, uh, 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 the experiment that Galileo probably did run, he didn't write about it right away, but he did write about it later in his life of dropping two objects off of a tower and showing, look, they land at the same time, even though this one weighs more than that one. He also uh, ha had theoretical arguments to back that up. That, that settles it. You know, you do enough questions like that, it'll settle an issue. A lot of medical experiments can settle the issue of whether a treatment is safe and effective. But in social science, it's so complicated and there are so many unobservable, observable, so many issues that we've talked about throughout this mini seminar that uh, it's unrealistic to think that any social science experiment, whether it's on this, whether it's on a guaranteed job, whether it's on some other social policy, it's not going to settle the issue. Asking for that is unrealistic. Will it add to our understanding? That one is a yes, but this is the second question. Second question for uh, looking at whether we should have experiments from a scientific perspective. Will it add to our understanding? Well, yes, in the sense that it will gather data that is useful for helping understand this policy. In that sense, yes, it will, it can, if it's at least well designed, can gather useful data. However, there's some caveats on that. One, it's not going to gather a huge amount of data compared to all the things we want to know about UBI experiments. And it will give us more data, more information. Uh, but as Frank Zappa has said, data is not information. Information is not knowledge. And it might, that information might not transfer into better knowledge if it's not understood. So the communication of this, it just increases the information we have available about UBI in a, in a positive way. But if it's not communicated right, it will not actually lead to greater knowledge about UBI works, how UBI works. And that, so if you're going to do an experiment, and you really want it to add to our understanding, you got to make sure wor to work on that. Um, now, so you got to really fight for it to be understood to make sure it works. Um, and uh, related to that is, and one reason to use this method to examine UBI, I can't remember who I'm quoting. It's in the book who I quote on this. Um, I didn't write it down in my notes here, and I'm not going to take the time to look it up. But one, one of the people I quote said, uh, all the available me methods of studying politics are pretty bad. All different things we have. Macroeconomic, macroeconomic analysis is pretty bad. General equilibrium analysis is pretty bad. Uh, political economy surveys, all kinds of things are actually really bad. We got a bunch of really bad instruments trying to understand this complex thing we call political economy. We got all these instruments that are bad. So just the fact that these experiments tell us so little doesn't mean they're inferior to all the other things we're doing. And it adds to them, and it gives a very different perspective. You got your field experiments, 
you got your laboratory experiments, then you got your data gathering from the policies that we that actually exist, and you got your inferences from theory applied to what behaviors you can witness, all of those bad things. Maybe if you put all those things together, our knowledge gets a little bit better and better. So it is, uh, uh, as long as it adds something, you got all these methods, all of which just add a little bit to our knowledge. You put those together and that's the best thing we can do to expand knowledge in social science. Another question from the scientific perspective, is there a scientific need? And the answer to that is also unequivocally no. There's not a scientific need. It is not like a medical experiment. A medical experiment, before you start giving this medical treatment to everybody, you've been effective. And experiments, at least over the short run, can give you a pretty good idea of whether it's safe and effective. Um, so it is imperative to do a medical experiment before you introduce a new treatment. Um, but uh, UBI isn't like that. It, 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 is, it is useful to know what's going to happen to it, but the experiments can't tell us enough to say it's going to answer. We have these doubts about it, these questions about it. A UBI experiment isn't going to answer the type of questions or nearly as definitively that a medical experiment, a, a medical, an appropriate medical experiment. I'm sure there are some medical issues where the experimentation is, is also as dodgy as, as what we're doing here. But there's also, luckily, there's two sides. There's no scientific, there's no scientific question that needs to be answered before implementation that we can answer. But there's also no serious downside to rolling out a new social policy of this type. Uh, there's certainly a serious downside to say rolling out a new policy of lock up all the criminals or invade Ukraine. You might want to experiment with that before you make that kind of mistake. Uh, but there isn't a big serious downside to say, okay, we, 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 we want to do UBI if it works. They say, say if we were of the mind, we're not sure UBI is going to work. But we want to do if it does work. So it's not really a political question now. It's really a sign. We're all agreed on. If we're all agreed on the politics, so we want to do it if it works, but we're uncertain about science. Does it work? Well, then we really wouldn't need to experiment. Then what we would do is we would start with a small UBI, which we know that's not going to harm anybody. Give everybody one euro a month. That's not going to crash the economy. Start it out at a low level. Ratchet it up, see how that affects the economy. If it starts to have a lot of negative side effects, stop ratcheting it up and maybe ratchet it back down. So you can introduce it. You can introduce it without causing a lot of problems. So there's no serious downside to cautiously rolling out social policy and learning as you go. Many social policies have been rolled out that way. Others have been, have been rolled out full on learning as we're going. Uh, Social Security in the United States, which is our name for our pension system, was put in place at a full level. Basically, they did a tiny pilot study, but basically it was put in place, uh, put in place up and operating right in a short time. They refined it a bit to make sure it works. Uh, Britain went from a private healthcare system to a public health care system virtually overnight in the late 1940s under Clement Attlee. And they had to work out the problems as they went. Didn't destroy the economy. Didn't make everybody sick. Yeah, it had some problems that they had to work out. Um, but people have been getting healthier since. It worked out. There's a lot of things like that you can do. Of course, we've done things like this for ill. We've had some bad social reforms. Uh, but I think in a lot of those cases, People want to say the welfare reform the United States did in 1996, I think a lot of had, had a lot of bad effects. But I think a lot of those effects were actually intended. People wanted to have a system that was more punishing to the poor, um, even if uh, even if it uh, didn't create didn't create more economic activity and wasn't cheaper, didn't save money. They just wanted to punish the poor and they 
you got a system that if that's your goal work um now so that's what i said from the from the scientific scope there's there's there is um there's not a scientific need for it and um it can't settle a, 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 any a compelling question that needs to be answered but it will increase our understanding so it's a useful scientific tool but not an essential okay now strategic approach to this question which i think is really where it's all at because that scientific stuff you know, there's not a lot to that um that was pretty simple the strategic approach will a a good um okay i i saw there's there's, there's one really bad way that you could look at ubi experiments strategically it says let's have a bunch of propaganda we'll run an experiment we'll report only the good results um we'll even trump up the good results and we'll kind of lie about the bad results we'll be totally disingenuous and we'll use this as a propaganda tool to fool our argument i am opposed to any kind any kind of of that sort of use of a fake experiment um but so if you if you if you're actually using a real experiment a real scientific experiment but you're doing it for political economy reasons you have to ask will a good experiment conducted under under fair and scientific circumstances dedicate demonstrate the efficacy of a ubi and therefore help attract support by that way and i think it's possible i think there's examples in the past where ubi experience have done that but it's also one that's risky it is risky it could backfire on you because of spin and misunderstanding and all kinds of things that i've been talking about quite a bit um, and be, uh, now, um, so those are those are reasons. That's a reason to do it, but it's a risky reason to do it. It's one way to try to further the movement. And one thing that people always say, if you've been coming to the uh, the UBI online seminars over the last few weeks, you've probably noticed that. Um, that I think I've gotten this question like at almost every presentation, why the double standard? Why do we have to experiment and experiment and keep experiment with UBI when so many other forms were just introduced without any advanced experimentation? Um, isn't that some kind of double standard? Well, I suppose that is a double standard, but there's a reason for it. And the reason for it is the UBI is an outsider. If, if the UBI had the kind of political support in the right places and the inside circles and in those imperfect or uh, dirty democracies that we have in most countries around the world, if it had the, the political support that would get it introduced, like all those other policies, we just simply go ahead and introduce it. We are experimenting with it because it is an outsider and a lot of people think this is one of the things we can try to make it an insider. Um, we're grasping for promotional possibilities by uh, by doing these experiments, hoping that it will promote UBI. It's not that we're there is no country I can think of that is actually on the verge of introducing the UBI and just delayed it in order to have these experiments with the possible exception of the United States in 1971. And that's been an awfully long time ago. Um, and that wasn't, and, the, inter, and the, the sad approximation of what they had in 1971 was uh, pretty far from, from either a UBI or a negative income tax. So uh, the double standard is not something we should really worry about. That's really something that UBI supporters are choosing we're choosing this policy because, well, we don't have a lot of other things to do with this kind of resources. Um, uh, it takes really a different kind of resource to say, um, organize marches all over, all over the cities in your country. That's something else you could do with time and effort and money put into UBI, but you're gonna get, you, 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 but they're kind of different kinds of resources. Um, and you're not going to get local governments or something to donate to do to support this kind of thing. You might get activists out on the street, but you're not going to get 
uh, the money donors to do that. The money donors, whether it's uh, private or uh, or a government entity, are more likely to fund something like this. It's something you can get the funds due that might help UBI that. And so a lot of people are taking advantage of that. Uh, so what you have to ask yourself is, you know, if it's worth doing, what else would we doing? We be doing with the same resource, the exact same resource. Um, our, and and very often I think it's different resources. And doing a UBI experiment doesn't preclude doing a lot of other things you do with UBI. Um, maybe if you're a major donor, if you're a major donor deciding where to put your money then you're one of the privileged people who actually wrestles with this question. But if you're somebody else, um, if you're, say, an economist who has a chance to write a grant, um, there's not a lot of grants you could write that are going to that are going to further the UBI discussion other than something along these lines. There are risks, though, and I'll give you some examples of risks. Um, I think that the UBI experiments of the 1970s at the time probably had a net negative impact on the guaranteed income movement in the United States and Canada at the time. It gave Congress a reason to say, well, during the early 70s, when they're really thinking about introducing some form of guaranteed income, it gave them a reason to wait and say, let's do this later after these experiments get done. And during that time, UBI lost a lot of political momentum. Then, when the results were released, a lot of the researchers were blindsided by the kind of spin that they were confronted with as soon as those raw numbers went out in the public. And that's certainly a risk, and that hap can happen again. However, it was also good in that. It was also good for the UBI movement strategically in those things. And one of those was just the mere fact that two, two governments of leading countries, the United States and Canada, ran a total of five experiments on this issue, gave it a worldwide legitimacy that it wouldn't have had otherwise. And over the years, although the pro-UBI side lost control of the rhetoric in the late 1970s, where people were saying if one, you know, one percent drop in or even one person works one hour less, that's a reason to fail the experiment, uh, as people did imply in some of those articles uh, that were written at the time. I think over the time since then. People like Evelyn Forget writing about it. And, uh, uh, David Kalinsky, I don't know if my work has had any impact on this level, but UBI supporters, I think, have regained control of the, of the rhetoric and understanding of those 70s experiments. So even though it might have had some negative effect in the 1970s, I think it's probably with the legitimacy and the information we're getting now and the building on them with the current experiments, I would say probably those experiments from 50 years ago are having a net positive effect on the worldwide uh, effort to promote UBI now. So strategically, I think it ends up in the long term having been a winner. In this case, I can't prove that. It's not the kind of thing that's very easy to prove. Um, and also the negative impact that they had in the late 1970s was not decisive. UBI, well, different versions of guaranteed income had their, had their vogue before these results came out. And the vilification of these results um, that happened in the late 1970s was, I think, in, uh, to a large extent, a symptom of what was already a decline in interest in, in expanding and streamlining and promoting and perfecting the welfare system. And it was more an outgrowth of this, this growing movement to just cut the welfare system or replace it with nothing, the kind of, the kind of political uh, change that brought 
people like Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan to power in the late 70s and early 80s. So I don't think it had a huge negative effect. And UBI was on the way out anyway. Yeah. Um, now, but then if you look at, and that's just, that's those experiments. If you look at some of the other experiments, such as Namibia and India, the ones that we can really look back now, we have, a, we have eight, 10, 12 years to look back on those now. We can say those seem to have an unequivocally positive impact on the UBI movement in those countries and around the world. They got people looking at it, talking about it, and the movement built from there. Um, now, then, can I draw any inferences? I don't really say this in the book. I thought about saying this in the book. I'm actually not sure exactly why it never got into the book, but it's that when is a UBI experiment most likely to be a net positive? And I would say that is true. The farther outside of main, mainstream politics it is, the more likely it's to bring new attention to UBI in that political context. If, it, if UBI is already a big thing talking about um, the net impact of an experiment might not, not do that much. Uh, but UBI is an outsider in a lot of places. Uh, the farther it's an outsider though, I think the more likely it is to have a positive impact. Um, and I also, it seems to be that the ones that begin with private initiatives, such as India, Namibia, um, uh, the, the seed program and so forth, um, also seem to have, seem to be more likely to have a positive impact. And that would include, uh, well, you know, Grundein Komen is a long way from finished, but that would indicate that Grundein Komen is one that's probably more likely to have a positive impact than say the Finnish experiment, which is really a, a top door sort of thing. And it was, the Finnish experiment was organized by the central government at a time when a lot of people were talking about UBI and it maybe deflected some thinking onto really a narrow, a very narrow look at UBI to the extent that it did. Um, and now, if, but if you ask me in a lot of cases, if somebody does have a lot of energy, if somebody is going to, has a lot of money to donate and they're thinking about donating that money to a UBI experiment, um, in the, especially in the United States where there's already 31 experiments going on right now and one was just concluded a couple of years ago, if a very wealthy person came to me and said, should I use this money for UBI experiment? I would probably say no. And the UBI experiment in the United States. So there's 31 others going along. What's the marginal value of one more experiment in the United States? I might say, give it to give directly in to promote the Kenya experiment. And that, I think that actually has, the Kenya experiment has a benefit that most of the others really don't have. That it is, it is also, it's also a, it's also an effort to help the individual. These UBI experiments, most of which we're doing that are two, three, four years um, on a few, on just a few people, they're not gonna huge impact on people's lives, but Give Directly is also essentially a charity. It is an effort to help the people who need it most. People are already donating, donating all kinds of money to help people in poor areas around the world. And if Give Directly's evidence is correct, this, the evidence indicates that this is the best way to help people. So I would say, give it to Give Directly, it'll make their experiment better, but also it'll, it'll have, it, it'll be giving, it'll be helping something that's given a UBI to, to thousands of people for, for 10 years or more. You, so you might, you might, Create it so they'll be able to give it to more people, but to have it last longer. It's really going to help people who are some of the people who need most help. So, for non experimental reasons, that might be worth doing. But, so I might say, give it to give directly, 
Or if, if I was a, a wealthy donor of the United States says, well, I want to do something in the United States to promote UBI. I've got millions of dollars to spend. Carl, how should I spend it? I would probably say do something else such as use that money to fund a campaign to get UBI on the ballot in some place, say Washington, D.C., or a small state like Vermont or something where it might have a, some place where it might have a good chance to get impact. The marginal value of one more experiment, not, not that great, but to have the first referendum, the first uh, petition drive to get UBI on the ballot uh, in the United States, I think would have a, a bigger strategic impact on, on the market. But that's that's a specific context that already has 31 experiments going on. It's going to be different in other contexts. But the big thing here with that, that I finish with in this chapter is that really there aren't a lot of wealthy donors with millions of dollars to spend calling me up and saying, Carl, how, would I, how should I spend the money? And of course, my first thing would be, you should fund my research. That, that would be my first answer. Uh, but anyway, they're not calling me up. And if they were, I'd I'd probably be heading an institute now. Uh, they're not calling me up. Um, and the question is not whether we should have tests of UBI, but how do we make the best of the UBI trials that are going around right now? There are privately funded, government funded, and mixed funded UBI trials going on around the world. The point is not, do we have them or don't we? The point is, how do we make them understood? How do we get the most out of them? So that gets me into the final chapter. Chapter 19, overcoming spin, sensationalism, misunderstanding, and the streetlight effect. How do we do this? How do we get the most out of them? Well, one is the first thing that I say here, and I think one of the most important things to say is there is no cure is that you can reduce you can reduce an experiment's vulnerability to spin sensationalism misunderstanding and the streetlight effect but you can never eliminate it one reason being that oversimplification is inherently easier to understand than genuine complexity Oversimplifications, I mean, it, it's really easy to understand an oversimplification. That's what they're for, to give people, to give people the impression that they understand something. Or even and and even if it's unintentional, people oversimplify sometimes unintentionally because they think they grasp something they don't. It's very easy to do. That's one of the things you're fighting. The, so the effort to overcome these problems is always going to be imperfect. These problems will always exist. We will always need to fight them, not just for UBI experiments, but for social science research of any kind. It's always an uphill battle against misunderstanding. And it's always only limited success. But there's something we can all do. There's something every person in that chain of connections that I've talked about from the citizens, the policymakers, the uh, managers, the designers, the researchers, then back through, through reporters, policymakers, and citizens again. In all that chain of connection, there's a lot we can do. Citizens, including citizen activists, people in the dedicated in the UBI movement, is Stop saying, I want an experiment. Stop saying, I want an experiment, period. Start saying, this is why I want an experiment. This is, these are things I want to know. And this is how UBI can help me learn those things I want to know. Start saying, I want to know these things about universal basic income. Look into, uh, it's such a simplistic it's such a simplistic uh, uh, demand to say, we, we want to bring an experiment here without any thought of what do we want to learn from this experiment? Think about there are things 
there are things that I don't know about UBI that an experiment can inform. That's why I want to experiment. Citizens should be talking about that. And that includes, that's mostly the citizen activists who are pushing for these things. And very often I see this over and over again in lots of different countries. We want an experiment. Why? Why do you want an experiment? Now, organizers, organizers who are not necessarily researchers, uh, the people, and they're not necessarily policymaker either, policymakers either. You got your policymakers that are making the decision to have an experiment. Those could be elected officials. Those could be private donors. Those could be a mix of the two. They're making the decision. They're going to hire some people to get this thing going. Probably it doesn't, it's not going to go directly from them to researchers. It might. They might hire a researcher to organize the whole thing. But very likely it's going to go next to a bureaucrat, an executive, a manager who is not an economist or a sociologist or political scientist, but is somebody who manages things, bring this together. But it might be. But so whoever it is that organizes, whether they are have academic expertise or not, what they need to do is to respect the public discussion. And re respect it means that there's a bunch of different people out there who are not organized into a body. There's a bunch of people talking about it, arguing about it, making claims about it, wondering about it, who are not organized to, in, into a body and say, well, I want you to study this, this, and this, and I've learned the techniques, and we can study those things with this, this, and this. Um, they can't do that. In order to respect the public discussion, you've got to look at what are people really saying? What are they arguing about? What empirical questions are they disagreeing on? How can we get them answers to the empirical questions they want to know? We have this limited tool in an experiment that's going to partially answer some of the things they want to know and not at all answer other things we want to know. How do we combine it with other things to inform what they really want to know? Everything needs to be tailored to that public discussion if we're going to respect it. Find out what all sides want, want to know about UBI. Design your experiment and how you employ the experimental results toward that discussion. If you just report the raw results, the control group did this, the experimental group did that, and ignore what little that really says about the true outcomes, people will make a hasty generalization for you. They will make a hasty generalization and say, oh, they say if we introduce UBI, uh, employment is going to drop by 4.6%. Well, that's not what a comparison between a control and experimental group tells you at all. And they will make that hasty generalization. You got to be aware of that. That doesn't mean they're stupid. That means that's the best information you gave them. And they're and and they they are they are making the mistake of thinking you wouldn't be giving that information if it wasn't telling them what they want to know not telling them what they want. But I think just as bad as giving people raw data and letting them make hasty generalizations is using your raw data with a couple of caveats for you, the researcher, to make hasty generalizations for the people. Well, this says, this says, uh, this says, uh, uh, employ, uh, this says, um, the experimental group worked 4.6% less than the control group. So that means uh, that means employment's gonna go down and that means we can't do it. That's a hasty generalization by a researcher. Researchers do these things and researchers shouldn't be doing it. They should be saying what we need to know to get this, either plugging it into other models, process it or discussing what little this tells you about how the market really works to get a realistic connection between the results and the bottom line, what people really wanna know, the cost effectiveness of UVI, you've got to admit that experiments are only a small part of improving our understanding of the bottom line. You've got to show people how little a UVI experiment can do 
in order for them to understand what it does. What it does is small, what it does, but what it does is important. If we think it's more important than what it is, we won't understand what it really is. Another problem is that people tend to, tend to conflate ethical and empirical issues. And economists are very guilty of this. Economists like to pretend that they've set all the ethical issues aside and they're only doing empirical issues. But what they're often doing is incorporating very strong ethical beliefs into the way they look at the empirical data. To free ourselves from that, we need to bring the ethics into the open. When people are arguing about this, when we're trying to respect the public discussion and listen to what they're saying, what ethical perspective is this person holding? What, is, what ethical perspective is this other person holding? They're looking at it awfully, not just making different assumptions about how it will work, but how we interpret the ethical value of how it does work. And you've got to report the results, taking into account the relevant ethical positions in the political context of what you're talking. Results mean different things, different people with different ethical positions. And if you pretend that you have a neutral position and, you're, and that, that bridges these two, you are probably just pretending and fooling yourself and maybe fooling some of your listeners. So you need to talk then about what little the results imply for a real UBI. People are going to make hasty generalizations. So will researchers. As a, a caveats will not solve the problem. What solves the problem, well, if anything, what at least combats the problem is a second round of analysis. You've got your raw findings. You can look at quantitative, quantitative pro, additional processing of that to simulate to simulate the unobserved parts of the market interaction that gets you from a raw comparison to an actual prediction of the market outcome. You can also look at qualitative analysis for the things that, the numbers that don't crunch very well. And you also need to ad admit the limits and the uncertainty and talk about these are the things that remain unknown that we need to try to uncover to get a better idea of what's going on. All of those things we need to do. Discuss the questions experiments can't answer. You can't show what experiments don't do if you don't explain what experiments can't do. And that's hard for a researcher to do because we spent so much time conducting these experiments and studying them that we think that they're really important. We might get an overblown idea of what they're important. We want to focus on what they do, not on their limits. But then people will never understand what they really never really understand what they really do if they don't have a good firm grasp of the limits. And they need our help to do that. What other evidence do we need? And especially for the streetlight effect, you've got to continually ask yourself. Are we, the researchers, focusing on these questions because they're important, or are we focusing on them because they're the easiest questions to answer? And you got to continually fight that because your mind is going to go to, I found this result. It's so exciting that I found this result. Everybody look at this result. Well, the result is worth talking about, but it needs to be talked about in context. And that's what brings me back again to the bottom line. Connecting things to the bottom line to a really thorough, not a hasty generation to the bottom line, but a thorough, a thorough look at how to get to the bottom line forces comparison of cost and benefit. And it requires you to work forward slowly. Many errors of interpretation that people will have going from your raw comparisons of, of control and experimental groups, the errors they will make 
about what that tells them about the bottom line for a real UBI, many of those errors are predictable. That's where researchers can aid understanding most. When they predict the errors, people are likely to make and they head them off in a way people can understand. That hasty generalization that keeps going up is the biggest danger. Findings are not votes for and against the policy. They're information points that needs to be put together with, with some other information to tell you about the bottom line for the, the, the bottom line questions uh, and the answers to the bottom line questions about this. Uh, and that needs to be understood in different ethical ways. Show the other theory and evidence that needs to be added to connect the findings with the bottom line. And everyone can help improve understanding in doing this. The researchers, the writers, the citizens, if they try to fight this tendency to oversimplify and make a hasty generalization from raw findings to, to a vote about saying, yes, this works, this doesn't work. It's not that simple. We all know it's not that simple. And so we've got to work on it. All right. Um, that is the end of my lectures on this book. Um, uh, before we take a break and then go to Katrina, Katarina, uh, do I have any questions on everything I've just said? All right. Let's, okay, uh, uh, Niharika. Um, so, um, your... Yes, yes, turn on, unmute and turn on your video. Okay, is that okay? Uh, don't turn on your, um, um, yeah, your microphone has to be on, uh, but, you're, but make sure that your speakers are off. Okay, but your, your is your microphone on? No, I unmuted myself just now. Okay, unmute again. Let's see. Let's we'll see what happens. Let's see what happens. Um. Okay. okay yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm, gonna turn, I'm gonna have to mute myself. This is gonna be hard. Okay. Okay. So I'm mute. Okay, I'm muted now. Go ahead. Unmute. Um. I think this. Is Okay. Yeah, I think this. No. Yeah, I gotta turn. I got Hello. Okay, I think this works. Um. Yeah. So, like, when uh, what you talked about, uh, political context. Mm -hmm. So, like, when articles talk about um basic income experiments in various countries, um, they talk about okay, like there was this effect in this country and there was this effect in that country and if they were like significantly different from each other or if they were similar and the criteria on which they differentiate between these um, countries is most commonly like whether that was a wealthy country or whether it was like a low like a developing or a low income country but like also like what i like what i want to ask is um most often these um experiments have been conducted independently um, so like the political context in a developing country would be very different from that in a wealthy country, right? So, um, so like if, um, if this policy would be to be like truly implemented in reality, um, how would the political context in that country impact, like would the effects that were found in the experiment be still be same as if it were to be like really implemented because of say corruption in some countries or like lack of awareness among like very poor people in that country about the policy because um like if it was to be a reality the political involvement of like political authorities would be much more and like it would be different in different countries because like how because of how it would be implemented yeah well okay now i'll once you turn yours off um so the uh but there's definitely, I mean, probably the biggest divide in political context is going to be between the less wealthy and the more wealthy countries. But that's not the only important one. And yeah, you picked out two of the things. There's uh, less wealthy countries tend to have more corruption and tend to have less political awareness 
by the people at, at the bottom, sometimes because they're so powerless and and have been have been Ill, Ill, Ill educated. But you get a lot of these problems in a lot of the wealthier countries too. And there are also there are cultural and political contexts. You can have a very wealthy, undemocratic country, um, or a very wealthy, democratic and low corruption country, or democratic but high corruption but wealthy country. Uh, but cultural differences are important too. Um, India and uh, and the UK are going to share some things that um, that with each other that say neither of them is going to share with with Germany um, or with or with say Argentina. Uh, so so it's it's complicated to look at the political context and and I don't think I can make a lot of generalizations about it to say it's, it's something you got to look at on a case by case basis. What's important here? Um, you know, our, our, and, and um, we've, when we make people as poor as we made them in rural India and rural Kenya and rural Ecuador, um, it makes it really hard to have democracy because um, we, 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 we have masses of people who have just with such low income because it comes such little power and little knowledge and you get caught up in your everyday thing. Um, that's a political context that's really hard for me to understand. It's not something I've studied. I know it's a massive problem. Um, do you have a follow-up to that? Okay. Um, so has there ever be, uh, been an uh, experiment that has tried to evaluate this, like uh, how it could be implemented like in a political context? Well, like, are there any plans of any of the experiments coming up, maybe? No, no I, I mean, one of the, uh, the uh, we've had experiments with UBI in, in lesser developed countries, but it's just been, we divide them into control experimental group, we give this control group, the UBI, don't give it to the, or sorry, we give the experimental group the UBI, we don't give it to control group, we, we compare the behaviors, and then we talk about how we think it's going to affect, it, uh, that's going to affect the political context. If we, if everybody did it, uh, that's about the limits to what people have been able to figure out so far about what to do. One of the compelling reasons to do it in lesser developed countries is because your money goes far. So, I, Give Directly has is, is talking about starting a program in the United States, and I'm 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 not enthusiastic about Give Directly. Di di diverting any of its resources to the United States because it's already funded by U.S. donors and they might want to give more to the U.S., but their money goes like a tenth as far in the U.S. as it does in Kenya. Um, so I'd like to see them help more people and gather bigger amounts of data, even though they're studying this very different political context. Um, it can't all be about study. It's also got to be about helping people. And there's, and there's benefits even Though the, the, the political economy is so different in Kenya than the countries that I've, I've lived in, the value in doing the big experiment, the really big experiment you can afford in Kenya is, so, I think, so much more valuable than, than a 30-second experiment in the United States. Um, so that disappoints me. Okay, any other questions before we go to our break? Okay, yeah. Okay. Uh, this works. Yeah. Um, I once did a seminar about uh, the economics of climate change, and we did talk a lot about the problem of telling policymakers about intricate reports and um, intricate modeling and experiments. And because policymakers usually are just interested in one number, they can easily comprehend and understand. And to make the connection to the UBI experiments, don't we have to live with some sort of oversimplification of experimental results to advance the policy in the minds of policymakers because they are burdened with time constraints and maybe also they are not economists or sociologists themselves so to get the policy to advance it in their minds don't we have to live with some sort of generalization of the results a a absolutely Absolutely, we got to live with that. And how to manage that to get the biggest understanding 
that we can out of how little attention span people have. And it's not that they're bad people that they have a short attention span. They got a lot of other stuff to deal with in their life. They don't have time to become a specialist in UBI experiment. And that's what happened. If you know everything a specialist knows, you're no longer a lay person, you're another specialist. Um, and that's a really good way of putting it. I, I get a lot of, I've gotten a lot of questions in this seminar that I wished I'd been asked before I finished the book and I could have incorporated. There would have been a better book to get my answers to these things incorporated into it. But what, what, what I'm thinking of there when you tell me that is that if you've got reason to believe they're just gonna understand one or two numbers, you've got to be real careful about what are the one or two numbers you're going to emphasize. And that, again, will put, depend on the political context. But I would really be leery, be very leery about doing what the US experimenters did in the late 1970s was the one number was what was the relative amount of work hours between the control and the experimental group playing right into the hands of the of of ubi opponents focusing on their favorite issue one they can easily demagogue if you're going to look at that issue maybe the one issue should be if you're going to look at that particular issue look uh, maybe look at um what is this going to do to what do we think once we put this through a micro simulation model what is this going to do to wages and total incomes report that number um report report that number or uh, i think even better is is to and this i've been saying this i've been saying for quite some time long before i wrote this book it's in this book but it's also in a paper that i wrote uh 10 or 12 years ago the bottom line or basic income experience is Focus on the effects, not the side effects. How much people work is a side effect. The effects are how much does it help people? If you're only going to report, if it's good, good strategic thought to think, I, I'm probably going to only stand one number, okay? Um, and Evelyn Forget did excellent with this when she was reporting on when she was reporting on the income study. Fewer hospitalizations numbers for that fewer mental health disorders lower incidence of violence focus on those kind of numbers the direct effects the, the we're what we're trying to do with ubi is help people how is it helping people what evidence are we getting for helping people um so i would focus i would try to focus on those things if you've got to report something about the labor market then i would go through the simulation models if you think you're it's really going to be only one small thing but yeah, that's that's a really important question. Okay, any more questions before we move on? Okay, Anna. Um, so if the like long-term goal of these UBI experiments is to implement, like have a government implement UBI, would having these experiments be more privately funded and viewed as like charity to people who need it? Um, does that almost stray away from the long-term goal? Because like it almost makes the experiments seem less official, less something that the government in the end would have to implement. Well, uh, okay, in the case of give directly. Oh, that, that time I didn't mute myself and I didn't have a problem. What's that? I did not mute myself. Okay, so maybe it was, I don't know. Well, anyway, uh, okay, so um, I'm thinking the other way, when it comes to give directly, I'm thinking the other way around. Give Directly started as a charity. And it was the, their idea was to be the evidence based charity. It says, we're going to be a charity that actually researches how can we help people to get the most, the, the, to get, for lack of a better term, the biggest bang for the buck. How do we research how to help people in the most effective ways? The prime goal of Give Directly at the start was not was was it wasn't even ubi it was it was one-time cash grants the prime goal was to help people they had a suspicion that helping people with cash grants was the way to go they started out helping people then they designed some studies which confirmed that 
cash grants do help with people. And they were then impressed with these one-time cash grants are helping. Well, what if we did, instead of one big cash grant, what if we did a UBI type grant, a little grant all the time? Let's do that. Um, and I hope that Give Directly doesn't be, become overcome by the idea that our only purpose is to study UBI, rather than our purpose is to help people when so, using this method, now that we've done enough study to figure out this is a really good method, it beats the free goats, it beats the free shoes, it beats the well drilling, it beats, it beats bribing dictators, it beats a lot of things that NGOs have done in lesser developed countries. We know that, use this model to help people, don't stray too much into, into just researching it for the sake of researching it. Now, if you can do both, Great, it's do both. And I think that the, I think the same logic works on both ends. If, you're, if your goal is to study it, if your goal is to study it, um, don't stray too much into, yeah, we're just gonna do this. We're just gonna do this to, to help these hundred people. We also wanna study this so we can, so we can uh, create better programs to help the whole country eventually. There's also, of course, uh, Third reason, a lot of these were started merely as demonstration projects to just tell a few anecdotes about helping people with this. That's how Mein Grundeinkommen started. Mein Grundeinkommen started with one basic income for one guy and is now uh, is a study of several, of, of 100 people. And they're hoping to ramp up to a study of over 1,000 people. Um, and it's gotten more and more. So it started neither with the goal of really studying it scientifically, nor with the goal of really helping a lot of people, but just collecting a few anecdotes. And they branched from anecdotes to, to this. So no, I don't think it's, it's, it's a huge problem. I don't, it's not, it could be a distraction to, to get stuff on, on helping the people. But I mean, the welfare of the people who participate in these programs is also a really important thing. 